Cheryl Lee, that radio chick here with you. Welcome to the Still Rocking It podcast, where we'll have news, reviews and interviews with some of our favourite Australian musicians and artists. Today I share a chat I had recently with Bongo Starkey, guitarist from legendary Australian band Skyhooks. Skyhook songs are embedded into the Aussie music landscape, like horror movie, ball and calling, living in the 70s, women in uniform, ego is not a dirty word, all my friends are getting married and many more. Join Bongo and I as we chat about the beginnings of Skyhooks, what interest he shared with his great friend and the world's most infamous train robber, Ronnie Biggs. The story behind the news headline, Sky Hook Goes Berserk with Axe. We talk about Missing Sherl and where to next with his Sky Hook show. What's Bob Bongo Starkey getting up to lately? Let's find out. We're joined in the Zoom studio today by Australian guitar legend, (laughs) Bob Bongo Starkey. From legendary Australian rock band from Melbourne from the 70s, Skyhooks. Thanks for coming and have a chat with me today. It's all right. The last time I saw you actually was January 2020 in Sue and Graham's backyard. You guys came and played a gig there in South Australia. Yeah, yeah, that was fantastic. And that was the first time I saw the female singer. She's amazing. Where did you find her? Well, I found her in a pub. As you do. She was actually singing for a band called ACDC, the ACDC cover band. We're speaking, of course, of Laura Davidson. She's just great. And a while later, Greg McCainch was asked to do a suburban festival. He was asked to get up and do three of you know the Skyhook suburban songs, which is Ball and Calling, Turek Cowboy and Carlton. So we went and did that, and it went down a storm. I actually sang most of that. And I'm not the greatest singer, but still went down well. So then the next year later, Greg was asked to do it again. And I said, oh, look, don't think so. You know, we've already done that, been there, done that, you know. And then he got back to me a month later and said, look, I, you know, I really like to do it. And I said, well, OK, well, let's try another singer. There's this girl I've seen. And so I tracked her down and she got up and did it with us. And, uh, you know, she brought the house down. And so that's where it sort of started. So, so you weren't so. actually searching for a female singer. It sort of just organically opened up to you. And it was a great fit because how many guys can actually do Shirley's vocals, really. Yeah, well, I've yet to see one. Exactly. Even Johnny Farnham didn't cut it. I don't know if you ever saw him on Hey Hey Saturday. He went up against Cheryl. Cheryl blew him off the stage. He had this unique voice. He didn't go into falsetto. He just went really high on speed. An amazing talent. Let's hear Shirley Strawn, Women in Uniform. Back more with Skyhook's Bob Bongo Starkey right after this. Let's start from the very beginning, Bob. Your dad was in the Air Force, so you moved around quite a lot. You've got a brother who's also musical. Any other siblings? Yeah, I've got two sisters. My little sister is actually a really great singer. Yeah, but my other sister is hopeless. Did you know from a very young age that music was your destiny or did that happen when you were in England for those couple of years with your dad in the Air Force? When we were in England, I was quite young. I was there in between the ages of nine and 11. My brother, he was older. He was four years older than me. And he actually started having guitar lessons there. It was when the Beatles broke and the Rolling Stones broke, he was right there amongst it. So when we came back to Australia, he was kind of a little bit ahead of the game. He started playing in a band with Joe Camilleri, actually, called the King Beats. And they were really good. I wasn't playing guitar or doing anything at that point in time. I actually started playing drums. I was like the drummer in the school band when everyone marched in on a Monday assembly. But I was playing this drum and it drove my brother nuts. So he bought me a guitar one Christmas. So that's where it started and I started playing, learning chords and whatever. As time went on, I, I, you know, I bought myself an electric guitar and an amplifier and started just messing with it, really. And it went from there, but my brother was definitely an inspiration. He ended up being the first member of the Skyhooks. He was in the Skyhooks. And when I was 21, I can remember I just had my 21st birthday. He had a gig with Skyhooks. 
Brooks. He wanted me to give him a lift out to this gig, which is in the outer suburbs of Melbourne. We went out there and and on the way out there, he said, this is actually going to be my last gig. I think this was only the third gig that he did with the band. So it was a very, very early stages. But they sounded great. When I was driving home, I said, oh, you know, what do you think? Do you think I could audition? He said, oh, well, why not? Give it a go. So I did. I put my name up and Greg uh, gave me a shot because basically he didn't have anyone else at that point in time. And also I had a van, which is a very handy thing to have if you're playing in a band. So it just kind of went from there. I I just never left. And the other guitarist, a really fantastic guitarist, actually a guy called Peter Inglis, he didn't want to uh, dress up and that was a part of the deal. Greg McCainch, he stipulated that we had to separate ourselves from the street, prepare for a, you know, for a performance and, you know, put on the, get doled up. Uh, but his original idea, I think it was along the lines of something like Gary Glitter, but he ended up getting a bit more than he bargained for with us, which just got quite silly. When Peter Inglis left, it was because he was a real hippie. He just wanted to play in shorts and bare feet, and he went and ended up joining a band called Captain Matchbox. Then Red joined. I'd known him for quite some time. I knew him from when I was about 16 because he went to university with my brother. You know, they're both there studying, you know, pure mathematics or what are they doing as a schoolboy and you know, i was starting to play the electric guitar or whatever on a saturday morning i'd pedal over to carlton to borrow my brother's wah-wah pedal right i get to my brother's place and he says oh no red's borrowed it so i pedal over to red's house and he was living in this terrace house in a cupboard underneath the stairs with a snake very interesting character <laughs> so red and i we knew each other but as soon as red joined i knew we were onto something big it felt really really positive he ended up sort of uh, taking the place of my big brother really we were quite close for a long time you know playing together and rooming together touring together and what have you let's have a song now one of the very few songs where red simons takes on vocal duties and he's also credited as songwriter from the living in the 70s album a song called smush if you listen very carefully to the words you'll see it's all about making yourself happy back with bongo straight after this open up your twisties and open up your thighs skyhooks formed in 73 had some really successful years into the beginning of the 80s a living in the 80s tour in 1983 one off reunion concert in 84 new material in 1990 including jukebox in siberia which peaked at the top of the aria singles chart for two weeks up the skyhooks for me, I um, I got into writing jingles and doing film soundtracks, and I was quite successful at that. That was really good for me, and, but uh, I got pretty lonely because, you know, you do all the recording, you deliver the tape, they give you a check. That's great. There's no, you know, there's no applause. There's no sort of feedback. I really love the live music thing. So I ended up buying a nightclub. It was a live music nightclub. It was a place called the Jump Club. I couldn't retain the name, so I just changed it to the club. We pervade live Australian contemporary uh, rock and roll and music there for five years, at which time I was nearly dead. I had to uh, sell the place. They were great days, actually. Is it a urban myth or did you chop up your agent's desk? And if so, how come? Well, it's true. It was sort of a, in the latter days of Skyhawks and we weren't being uh, treated with much respect. Frank lied to me, basically, and... Um, and it caused me to have a lot of egg on my face because I was effectively running the operation of the band at that time. And I turn up to this gig and there's the crew and, you know, the rest of the band and they're going, hey, Bongo, there's no gig. The egg was on my face. I kind of let it go for a couple of days, but my blood was boiling. So I decided to um, borrow my dad's chainsaw and go and chop up his desk. I drove to the car park at Mushroom Records and I'm out there in the car park trying to start this chainsaw. It would not start. I'm in a leather trying to start this thing. I went off down Chapel Street and got an axe. And I'm feeling the axe. I'm thinking, it's not sharp enough. So I went back and I got a sharpening stone. And I sat there in the car park sharpening the axe until it was right. And then I went in the back door and up the stairs and down the corridor, jumped up on his desk, started carving the name of a piece of female anatomy onto his desk. Because you could go, <coughs> it worked out quite well, right? And all the time, he's sitting there on the phone talking. 
it was hilarious. In the end, I just chopped off his, you know, all the phone cords and what have you, and basically shut himself because he could see how furious I was. But then I just calmly jumped off the desk, walked down the corridor, out the back door, <laughs> Next day, driving down the road, you know, you have those uh, newspaper boards they used to have out the front there yes. that had Skyhook goes berserk with axe. Anything for a good, good headline. It was good. Back to the club, anybody who was everybody through there, including Neil Young, Tom Petty, Michael Hutchins, Stevie Nicks, Mick Fleetwood, and they'd come up and enjoy your warm hospitality. I wonder you could only do it for five years. It was pretty good hospitality, by the way. <laughs> I had a sushi bar up there. Right? It was the first sushi bar in Melbourne, actually. It was called the Desperately Seeking Sushi Bar. Very clever. Cocktail bar upstairs, and, and the main room was downstairs where the bands played, and upstairs with this 250 capacity bar. All these guys that come in after the show, you know, after they done their shows or what have you. Sometimes they come in to see a band. Neil Young came in to see the Johnnies. They were playing that night. Michael Gudinski brought him in. It was fantastic. I mean, meeting guys like that, it just really made it. I think one of the best acts ever put on there was Eric Burden. From the Animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Frank Stabala pulled the stunt on that gig. And see, I paid a lot of money to have Eric Burden exclusively. He's supposed to be on at one o'clock, Eric Burden, but he just didn't turn up. You know, I'm thinking I'm going to kill Frank because I knew what had happened. So he turned up at about two o'clock in the morning. My license runs out at three o'clock. And anyhow, he got on that stage and he blew the place apart. It was fantastic. And of course, he didn't get off until about 4 a.m. And it was just one of the best gigs I ever had there. Let's hear a song from The Animals now, one of the best gigs ever at the club house of the rising sun back more with bongo in a minute there is a house in new orleans look the club was fantastic for that reason it was really good live music but after about five years you know i was getting really tired of it and also disco thing was coming in so it made it more difficult for me to operate i sold it i think it was the last club to be sold at a profit at the end of the end of the 80s there that was just a great era for me i really loved doing that you went to south america and it sounds like you became really close friends with ronnie Pidge. now how does a rock star and a train robber get together over drinks as you do selling the club my deadline was to go to the carnival in rio I'd always wanted to do that. And I always loved Brazilian music, like the bossa nova and all that sort of stuff. It was basically the club went and I went to South America just to sort of, you know, have this really great holiday and what have you. But ended up staying there because I just loved it. Brazil, for me, it was, you know, I just felt at home. I don't know if you've ever, ever done that or you fly into a country and you just feel like, wow, I'm home, you know. If I kept my mouth shut there, people thought I was Brazilian. Kind of had a bit of a look, had long hair. I went to the, the carnival. There was this English guy sitting in front of me and we ended up getting on and we were having beers together and what have you. He was over there painting Brazil, you know. He was travelling around Brazil, so he was at the carnival and then he went up to Manaus, was going to Salvador and just painting. I went and joined him up in Manaus and then I went up and stayed you know, in, in the forest up there. It was an amazing experience. I met up with him again in Salvador. We had a great time there and then he went off again and I went down to Rio. He, he called me one day at the hotel and he said, oh, Bob, I've got this book. It's on the great train robbery. I'm going up to meet Ronnie Biggs so he can sign it. You know, I said, oh, well, you know, tell him you know, I'm from Melbourne and you know, if I can come up, that would be great. And so that's what happened. He gave me a call. He said, oh, yeah, Ronnie, would love to see you come up. And from that point on, we became really good mates. The English artist, his name was Andrew Hugan. He went back to London. Ronnie and I would start having lunch. I invited him on this tour down south. They had these tourist boats that sailed out of a, a town called Itakurasa. They went around these sort of little islands and you had lunch and it was real tourist crap, really. And we stopped at one of these islands and there was this lady who had this little house for sale there around the other side of the island. It was this beautiful little Portuguese fishing village. It was just paradise. There was no English. It was really quite primitive. There was this little house there. She was selling it. You know, I said to Ron, I says, do you want to go halves? You know, we were pissed, smashed. He's called out. He says, I can't remember her name, but he says, we'll buy it. Come to town on Tuesday. 
we'll settle up. So we ended up buying this house. <laughs> and that was the start of a great friendship. So we've spent a lot of time uh, just down there renovating. He fancied himself as a renovator and so did I. And so he used to boss me around, tell me what to do. <laughs> While we're down there, he just told me all the stories, the robbery and what have you. And that sort of started this thing where his 60th birthday was coming up. I offered to fly the guy that busted him out of jail to his 60th and film it. And so that's what happened. And so we ended up uh, flying out this little guy called Paul Seaborn. He was the guy who actually took him over the wall. It was just magical. So I filmed them getting together for the first time, them telling how they actually organised it and how they did it. So it was really quite something you know, for me. It was just one of those great moments in my life, having to come back to Australia because I had to look after my daughter. You'd have a very rare insight into one of the most notorious bank robbers of all time. Well, I've got to tell you, there was a time there was no one on the face of the earth knew more about it than I did. Yeah, I ended up going back into England and researching it all. And I interviewed Jack Slipper, the guy who, you know, who, who actually caught him and chased him from Scotland Yard. You know, I interviewed everybody. It was really good. But I had a lot of difficulty signed up four times, then I got cancelled four times. So in the end, I just said, oh, look, I'm not throwing another cent at this. It's too hard. I interviewed Malcolm McLaren, and I got the most spectacular interview from him. Look, I've still got the footage and maybe I'll do something with it one day, you know. Mm, probably that story is a whole interview on its own. I'm sure you've got some amazing stories to tell. The Skyhook early years, you were trendsetters in the glam rock era. First album, Living in the 70s, number one. Second album, a year later, Ego is not a dirty word, number one. Followed by two more top 10 albums. Can you remember much of it to tell us any stories? I can try. Yeah, I mean, there were some really heady times. We were real busy. It was a hell of a ride, that's for sure. And the Egos were interesting. The great thing about that band was we just had this amazing songwriter in Greg McCage. There are no two songs the same. You know, he had a very cynical way of looking at things and casting his eye across situations. It was just like endless. It was just amazing. You know, whenever, you know, we'd go into rehearsal, he'd have these songs. You'd just go, wow, you know, very diverse. You didn't know what was going to come next. There was a lot of pressure on him for that reason. He kind of felt that pressure sometimes and that created a bit of tension. Look, it was just an amazing writer. It was really good for, you know, from a guitar playing because... I'd never had a lesson in my life and it was just like being able to sort of focus on working on these tunes and, and delivering riffs and what have you. And that's what, what I love doing it now because going back to it, it's a real workout, you know, as a guitarist. You've got to have your A game to play a set of skyhooks. I'm just having a lot of fun doing that. What moment. I love about his songwriting is how he manages to talk about just typical Australian things and typical Australian places and weave Australia through his songs and what is great now with you performing we still get to see all these fabulous songs that we grew up with and loved and danced all night to we get to see them live all over again yeah and played pretty tight too I've got a terrific band and we have a lot of fun and Laura's spectacular you know the audience loves her and she loves the audience you know from 1975 Ego is not a dirty word Skyhooks' second album which spent 11 weeks at number one of its 10 tracks Greg McCainch wrote eight, co-wrote one with Steve Hill and one was written by Red. After Skyhooks, Greg was on the board of APRA and became an intellectual property lawyer, <laughs> which we won't hold against him because what a legacy of music he created. Here's the title track and number one single from that album, Ego is Not a Dirty Word. We'll speak more with Bongo about what he's getting up to now straight after this. If I I remember two years ago going back to the up close and personal gig at Sue and Graham's. There was not a spare space on the dance floor. This is when you used to be able to dance, remember that? <laughs> and we were just loving it. it. It is a good set. And, you know, it's not like we're playing a 12 bar blues, you know, for 12 songs. But yeah, it's fun. Laura loves it. I've got a great guitarist who plays all of Red's parts really well and it gets great sound. It's a very happy band. You know, I really enjoy it, actually. It's got the real band ingredients, not just like a bunch of players. 
we actually get up there and really enjoy it. Well, it's quite obvious to the audience that you do. You're still wearing your crazy costumes. And as you say, the most important thing, loving what you do, which really comes across, I think, to us in the audience. Well, you've got to have a lot of humility to wear those outfits, I tell you. Because <laughs> we're not 21 anymore. Tell me about it. Although actually. we feel like it on the inside. This year, I turned 70. We'll probably do something. It'll probably be we're living in our 70s. Perfect. <laughs> Did you think all those years ago when you were 21 that you would still be performing and still loving it? In your 70s? Look, I, I didn't think I'd be playing Skyhooks, but I thought I had an inkling I'd still be playing guitar. I love all like, those guitars out of the 50s, Chuck Berry and, and Scotty Moore and James Burton, all those guys, and I really enjoyed playing that stuff. Quite honestly, I didn't think I'd be doing this. None of us did. But I think if Cheryl was still alive, I reckon we probably would have done something. As you said, it, it disappeared at the beginning of the 80s and then we came back. At that point in time, coming back into a rehearsal room after a break, you realise the reality of the chemistry. I mean, there was a definite chemistry amongst that five, mm. you know, written myself. I don't know what where that comes from, but it was definitely there. I would have loved to have actually been able to sort of, again, you know, do something with that, you know, those five guys. But, of course, uh, that can't happen. No. And it won't happen because uh, Red's not in great shape at the moment and uh, I don't think he's been playing guitar for some time. But anyhow, you never say never. I was speaking to Rock and Rob Riley just at the end of last year and he really, really misses Sheryl. I think we lost Sheryl in 2001. The whole nation misses him, really. What a character. Well, he's much loved. There's no question about that. God, at his funeral, people flew from all over the world just to be there. You know, he was great TV, great at radio. He was much loved, you know, in the surfy scene. Oh, he's an amazing guy. Very sad. Now for a song that, at least for me, is synonymous with Skyhooks and Shirley. Horror movie. Released in 74, the second and final single from Living in the 70s. Again, picking at number one staying there for two weeks. Do you remember running inside at six o'clock on a Sunday night to see Skyhooks perform this song on Countdown? And in 1975, the King of Pop Awards, the song won Australian Record of the Year. Widely recognised as one of Skyhook's signature tracks. Again, written by bass guitarist Greg McCainched. It's about how the world has taken a turn for the worse with all of the chaos in society. To the point where watching the nightly TV news is like watching a horror movie. I think Skyhooks were well ahead of their time. I just wanted to congratulate you for your induction into the RE Music Hall of Fame back in 92. I mean, I think it quite deservedly, you know, we're definitely up there. And Oh, absolutely. Definitely one of those bands that is part of Australia's DNA, part of our psyche. And I think Ego is not a dirty word. Album of the Year for groups in 75 and the king of pop awards the list goes on horror movie australian record of the year ego most popular australian album greg best australian songwriter in 75 so that proves your theory he was a great songwriter straight in a gay gay world best cover you know i mean straight in a gay gay world he comes up with stuff <laughs> like that he was ahead of his time there wasn't he he really really was well ahead of his time he was out there on his own you know he wasn't just writing little love tunes actually i bumped into a guy called marty roan he said that greg had written him a song and I'm like, oh, really? You know, because I haven't heard, you know, any McCainch songs for a long time. I didn't think he was writing. But uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what that is. It would be wonderful to, for him to come out and write some new tunes. I wish he would. Maybe you guys can do a collaboration. Just see what happens. So, look, I'm really enjoying what we're doing now, playing a, a set of Skyhook stuff really tight. Never say yes. never. Bob Bongo Starkey and his Skyhook show featuring Laura Davidson. We've got some dates coming up this month in January. Where can we go to find these dates, Bob? 
Working your farm, Friday 21st, uh, we're going to be at the Wyala Middle Black Theatre, 22nd of January, the Tumby Bay Soldiers Memorial Hall at, over near Port Lincoln. We'll be there during the festival. We're going to be at the Bridgeway Hotel in Adelaide. That's where I'll see you. On Tuesday the 25th of January. Yeah, we'll be rocking out of there, I tell you. <laughs> On the 26th, we're down at Victor Harbour at the McCracken Country Club. That's Australia Day and Bob Bongo Starkey and his Guy Hook Show will be playing with Adelaide's own Mastered Apprentices that day. And then we're heading out to Manham on the Friday the 28th, Toria Hotel. And on Saturday, 29th of January, we're going to be in Mount Gambia, Robert Helpman Theatre. So that is a pretty busy week. Six shows in eight days. There you go. <laughs> You've still got it. You are proof of my theory <laughs> that rock and roll is the fountain of youth. Well, fingers crossed we'll be there because this corona virus thing is a bit of a worry. Hopefully it'll all come together. Yes. Have you guys ever played at the Bridgeway before in Adelaide? Oh, I think it was called the Paraka then, wasn't it? It is out at Paraka. Because we play there a lot. thought you might have. It's a great venue. You'll love it and I'll see you down the front. One more quick question. What sort of music does Bongo like to listen to? My musical taste is really diverse. Sometimes during the day, you know, around the house, I put on Foxtel 70s music and just listen to all the Australian 70s music. I just, I I love all those bands, Australian bands from the 70s. I just think it was ours, you know, it was great Australian music, really great bands. Just having in the background, I really quite like that. But then um, I'll put on the Rolling Stones one day and just play the hell out of it. Another time I'll put on Little Feet. Might put on, you know, Taj Mahal, Rai Kuda, you know, any any really good guitarist too, you know. I could play Elvis all day and I could play Chuck Berry all day. Sometimes when I'm working, that's what I'll do. I'll just put on Chuck Berry all day. I just love it. And, of course, Bob Dylan. I could play him all day as well, you know. Well, thank you so much, Bob, for coming and having a chat with us today. Fingers crossed. We get to see you very soon in Adelaide for the Bob Bongo Starkey and the Skyhook show. I'll be there just like ringing a bell. I can't wait to see you guys again at our Bridgeway. It's a old 80s venue who have gone back and taken live music on again. It's wonderful. You know, I've heard it's really good. And, uh, you know, we've got a really good show. We're going to do all that audio-visual stuff again. So looking forward to that. Come and say good day when we're there. Will do. Thanks so much. Stay safe. I'll see you then. See you later. Let's go out now with one of Bongo's favourite musicians. How about... Chuck Berry, Johnny Be Good. Down in Louisiana, across the New Orleans, we're back up in the woods among the evergreens. You're with Cheryl Lee, that radio chick. Thank you so much for joining me on the Still Rocking It podcast. Hope to catch you again next time. Get out when you can, support Aussie music, and I'll see you down the front.